please do that and stay muted when you're not talking so we don't get a whole lot of interference. Gosh, the historic challenges keep coming. What about these back-to-back -back, uh, winter storms? Did, did anybody break ice this morning for the livestock besides Charlie? Anybody? Keith, how thick was the ice this morning? Do you know? Keith Harrison, you should know. It's about <laughs> close to two inches thick. I had to cut it with a shovel, blade of a shovel to get it done. So um, it's about an inch, an inch thick. Uh, yeah. In Watertown. Uh, <laughs> and we, we, it was it was an opportunity. Yeah, that's for sure. We get so many uh, issues these days. Keith and I call them opportunities to keep keep sane. Um, yeah, so we've got we've got a lot of uh, good updates today. You know, it seems like forever since we've met uh, last. Uh, I continue. There's a lot of big highlights. Uh, you know, we've got the major health update. We're going to have a uh, budget update by uh, Shannon Klonowski. Uh, our uh, CFO, and I continue to be impressed with my boss, the governor, on his support for agriculture and forestry as evidenced by the budget. You know, we're getting a $5.5 million increase in ag enhancement. Uh, there's a there's $5 million in there to um, for Wilson County to, to get infrastructure to potentially host the state fair. And um, there's some other things too in there that uh, that you'll see as she goes over that, as, as well as uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, maintenance and deferred maintenance that we desperately, desperately been needing to do something about in the past years. And then uh, looking forward to Dr. Phil's health update, see how that goes. So uh, we're going a little bit out of order uh, traditional order. We've got John uh, up first. Uh, in the, the hospitality industry has sure taken this on the chin, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you, John. So go ahead. Not hearing you yet. Still on mute. Tina, is he? Yeah, how's that? There you go. There you go. Good deal. Well, I appreciate it, Commissioner Hatcher. I, I contacted Commissioner Hatcher earlier and asked if I could go early today because I got an all-day board meeting by Zoom uh, after this. So I appreciate that, Commissioner Hatcher. Thank you for for letting me go on first. Um, this is this is a time when we've been able to start getting year-end data for 2020 for the industry, and as Commissioner Hatcher mentioned, our industry took it on the chin uh, in 2020, which which is not a surprise. Uh, when people can't travel, they can't spend on travel. So uh, we're we're kind of compiling now all of the data from 2020. And the sources that we will that we deal with are U.S. Travel Association, uh, STR, Smith Travel Research, <coughs> Longwoods uh, Destination uh, Analysts, uh, and it's it's kind of a mixed bag. Obviously, 2020 was a hard year for us economically. Uh, Across the United States, we lost almost $500 billion in travel related uh, expenditures due to COVID 19. Uh, travel generated tax revenue during 2020 declined by 36%. So it doesn't just have an impact on uh, the, the travel related businesses, uh, the, the hotels, the lodging, the restaurants, uh, all of that. It has a huge impact on state and local government as well because of those tax dollars that are typically generated by visitors uh, were not there. So a uh, big hit all the way around. Uh, and employment, uh, the hospitality and tourism industry took it harder than anybody else. Uh, almost four in 10 of all US job losses in 20, 2020 uh, were in the leisure and hospitality industry. Uh, that's an enormous, uh, and that, that comes from the U.S. Department of Labor. That's a straight out uh, uh, report from them. Uh, that is that is triple the number of an unemployment of the next hardest hit industry. Um, currently, 39% of all the unemployment that is uh, attributed to COVID, 39% uh, of it was in the hospitality and tourism industry. Uh, 
makes sense. If people aren't traveling again, they're not spending, they're not staying at hotels, they're not visiting attractions, they're not eating in restaurants. Uh, restaurants get a double hit because it affects not only visitors, it also affects uh, locals who may or may not uh, dine at their local restaurants. Uh, the, the current unemployment rate in the hospitality industry right now is 16%, uh, which is three times the overall U.S. Uh, unemployment rate. So, obviously, not the best of news. Uh, lodging statistics uh, for just uh, the most recent lodging statistics, for example, uh, were uh, that they were relatively flat. Um, and the occupancy rate, uh, current occupancy rate in the U.S. is 40.9%. Uh, that's down 30, almost 30 and a half percent from the previous year. Uh, occupancy drives everything. That's the number of rooms that you've got to sell and how many of them are actually sold. Most hotels uh, cannot operate on a 30% occupancy rate. Uh, with their fixed costs, uh, you're going to have to hit 50 or above and, and typically 60 uh, to 70% occupancy to, to start making profits. Uh, their, their ADR, which is the average daily rate uh, in the United States, was $91.44. Well, that's down almost 30% 30 30 from the previous year. Uh, if, if you are inclined to travel, you can get some really good deals right now in hotels because those rooms are sitting empty and they're, gonna, they're, they're willing to talk to you about rate. The REVPAR, uh, REVPAR is a, is a good economic indicator for, it means revenue per available room, and it takes in a, into account everything, not just how much you might get for the room, but also the food that you might sell or the, uh, the meetings, anything that's involved, revenue generated per the number of rooms you have in your hotel. The REVPAR right now is $37.44. This time a year ago, it was 100 and, 110, 115 per rep, so that's quite a hit. Um, but there is good news. Uh, there, there, the, as we look towards 21, uh, there's been some really good studies on, on consumers and what they're thinking about uh, going into 21. Um, and trip planning, trip planning, not trip activity, but trip planning is beginning to grow significantly. Uh, all indicators are right now that most people are going to defer their travel plans until April uh, at the earliest. That's great because uh, the last uh, study done in November of last year, before there was vaccine, before there was any good numbers or improving numbers, uh, that figure was somewhere in July. So we, we see that season may have a little bit of a spring jump. And that, that's great. 81% uh, of all U.S. travelers are planning to travel sometime in the next six months. That is an enormous uh, increase uh, from where we were just in September, October of last year, when that figure was around 25 to 30. So we've seen a huge jump in the number of people who are saying that they're planning to travel in the next six months. Uh, and that is that 81% that is the highest level of intent to travel since the pandemic began. Um, most, well, I'm sorry, uh, as of February, 35% of the travelers said they were going to wait until the, uh, until they received a vaccine, uh, and 37% said the vaccine would have no impact on their travel plans one way or the other. So interesting mix there. Um, their, their perception of safety of travel seems to be, uh, improving, um, as, and their optimism for travel. And when we were in the throes of summer last year and so on, people just had no, uh, they, they had less information uh, to plan. They had less experience in uh, safety protocols. They had less confidence in the travel industry uh, and its ability to provide safe uh, accommodations, safe dining, safe uh, uh, protocols for an attraction. Uh, so that perception by consumers is, is increasing. Uh, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is the travel plans, uh, the highest indicators, things that people want to do right now uh, as they look towards 21 travel. They're looking for scenic beauty, warm weather, outdoor activities, beach destinations, and national parks, uh, and most plan to travel by car rather than by other means of transportation like air or rail. 
the reason that's really good news is except for the beach, we got it all. Uh, and, and, and I, and I, uh, I know commissioner Ezell well enough to know that if he could do it, he, he, he'd move Tennessee to the coast so that we could have the beach too. But, but, you know, when you start talking about scenic beauty, warm weather, outdoor activities, national parks, and the fact that we're a drive destination, those are all very good indicators for Tennessee going into 21. So we're, we're, we're excited about that. Uh, meetings and conferences are still in the tank. Uh, they just are uh, most meeting planners uh, are say they've got requests for proposals out, but fully 85% of them really don't think they're going to have a face to face meeting uh, this year, or at least not until 3rd quarter of 21. Uh, so, uh, that that puts for for uh, a state like Tennessee, which. Which has a lot of, of it receives a lot of value from the meetings, conventions and events. Uh, uh, sector of the industry. Um, that's not great news, but it gives us some hope for the fall. Um, and they, it was interesting that that 81% uh, of meeting planners felt that it's going to take until 2023 to get back up to where we were pre post pre COVID in terms of the meetings and conference events. At the same time, there are destinations uh, and venues that are starting to book. Uh, the Music City Center, the new Memphis Convention Center, uh, Pigeon Forge has got a number of activities going on at LeCant Center. Uh, Chattanooga is doing the same. So they're starting to again. It's it's perception on part of the uh, part of the traveling public that not only can you have a meeting, you can have a meeting safely. It's different, but you can do it. Uh, so that's kind of where we are right now in traveling. And I'm sure as, as Zach will be talking about in a few minutes, there's an awful lot going on on the national level as well. Um, they're, they're very active in terms of travel and tourism right now. Um, we, we are very involved in that as our, our association is very involved in that, uh, as is national Resident <laughs> association, American hotel and lodging, uh, us travel, uh, all of, all of the major organizations that we're affiliated with. Uh, we were able to, and we were delighted that Congress passed a restaurant relief bill. Uh, restaurants, uh, probably one of the hardest hit industries of, of all. And uh, the restaurant relief bill will give some direct aid, uh, both financially and uh, in terms of uh, paperwork and everything else. Uh, hoops that you have to jump through to get, uh, get back on your feet, uh, knowing that the vast majority of restaurants are independent rather than chains. So, uh, we're delighted with that. There's been an extension of PPP to nonprofit organizations such as Convention of Visitors Bureaus, uh, regional tourism organizations, uh, and there have been a number of, of initiatives coming out of Congress and the new administration related to aiding the hospitality and tourism industry because it's such an important part of the national economy. So, so it's a mixed bag. It's kind of like this snow out here. It's it's uh, it's it's inconvenient. And it's slippery, but I tell you what, it sure is pretty. So that's the way we're kind of approaching 21. It's been slippery. It's not pretty, but we see some better days ahead and we just have to stay in line with, with making sure uh, how to keep our guests safe uh, and our visitors safe and that we follow those protocols. Uh, and, and so we're, 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 as, as, the, as the physician would say, we are cautiously optimistic going into 21. So Commissioner Hatcher, that's, I'm, I'll be glad to answer any questions if anybody has any. Yeah, I've got one. So do you think uh, there's a massive amount of pent up demand? Mm -hmm. If my family's any indication, they're already, my grandson's wanting to go to Disney World like immediately. So, exactly. you know, so would you anticipate to have a the second half of 2021 to be a boom? And also to overcome, not overcompensate, but to so that 21 could be salvaged. I mean, revenue wise, probably for the whole year. Uh, I, I don't know that I feel that optimistic. I think what we'll see, first of all, as a grand, it could, ha it could happen, though, right? It could, it happen. could, it could, be, it could happen, yes, sir. Uh, and and as a grandfather myself, I know that if that grandbaby wants to go to Disney World, you're going to go. So yeah. you know, that's that's just part of the that, that's one of the things that we count on in the travel industry. Uh, but yes, sir, there is a, there's a huge pinup demand right now until, uh, most of the studies we've seen, uh, ha have indicated that until we reach a point where there is herd immunity, where there is a broad, uh, uh, vaccination of the American public, uh, 
uh, the people are going to remain somewhat cautious, uh, optimistic, but cautious. Uh, they're going to, they, they want to go more to places uh, where there are not crowds. Uh, and so, but even a place like Disney is an excellent example. Dollywood's an excellent example. Early on, they adopted protocols. You can go to Dollywood, you can go to Disney World, and actually you can go quite safely. Um, it, it is a perception problem. It is, it is in the traveling public's mind. Uh, and, and Disney, for example, it depends on what market you're talking about. If if you're if if you are you, Commissioner Hatcher, coming from Nashville, that's not a problem. You get in the car and you drive. Orlando is such a heavily air service uh, destination that people are still a little little cautious about getting on an airplane. So uh, you'll see destinations like Tennessee, which is a drive primarily a drive destination that has a lot of those outdoor venues, uh, national parks, um, those those types of things. I think you'll see us recover more quickly than places like Florida and California and New York. Um, and, and so that's our intention. I, I would be optimistic for the third quarter of 21. I think by the time we get to September and October, uh, we'll be in a whole different situation nationally in this pandemic. And uh, that will affect everything, including travel intent. I came to Discovery Park in Union City, Doc. Absolutely. One of the coolest places in this state and probably one of the least known. Uh, we held a, uh, a West Tennessee regional, it was called Tourism Works for West Tennessee. Uh, and we held it at Discovery Center. And I want to tell you, I, you know, I've seen facilities all across this country. I've seen uh, attractions all across this country. Uh, Discovery Center is second to none. It is one of the most uh, outstanding first class facilities. And unfortunately, not many people know about it yet. So uh, I know that's something they're working on and, and, and certainly we're working on the Department of Tourism is working on helping them get that message out. But you bet you Discovery Park is is cool. Discovery Park is very cool. If you don't know where it is, you need to go. Uh, Northwest Tennessee. So all right. Well thanks John. That we're Sir. we're all optimistic that things will get rapidly better. We'll Good see deal. what Dr. Phil has to say. I don't see is Zach on? I don't see his cowboy hat. <laughs> Maybe it's got frozen or something. Could be. I'll, I'll wear my cowboy hat next time, Commissioner. Okay, please do. <laughs> Thank you for letting me go early today. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, there's a cowboy hat, but that's the wrong go. guy. <laughs> see Andy Holt there. Uh, Tina, is Zach on? Do you know? He may be snowed frozen in Washington. Tina? Have you heard from him? That's okay. I haven't heard from him. I was checking the list. He's not on here. Okay. We'll move on to uh, the rock star of the health department, Dr. Phil. I know you're, hopefully she's on. I am. Can you hear me, Commissioner? I can. I don't see you, though. No, sorry. I'm uh, I'm battling some broadband issues, so I'm not going to do video if that's okay. Oh, that's fine. I'm trying to yeah. preserve <laughs> preserve the audio and keep that going. Let me share my screen here, um, and we will get started. <clears throat> this is going to be optimistic too, right? I think mostly optimistic. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you see those? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll um, just fly through some data updates to start with. Um, as a reminder to everyone, these three main buckets of trends are what we've been really watching for the, almost the last year now. So, um, so first, looking at our emergency department data, we see that blue line for COVID-like illness continues to decrease, um, really has been on the decline since late December. And then when we look at that orange line for influenza-like illness, we see that that has remained very low, have really not had much of a flu season this year in Tennessee or really anywhere across the country. Um, when we look at our case counts, we see a really precipitous decline over the last six weeks or so. Um, cases have declined over 70% since our peak there in uh, MMWR week 51. I'll say that the rate of decline has slowed a bit. We've, we've leveled out. A little in the last couple of weeks, um, we're still averaging over 10,000 cases being diagnosed a week. Um, so that's still a lot of disease. And I think, you know, just to sort of compare, um, this is our summertime 
spike here in week 28, where we were at just over 15,000. So although we're down a little bit below that, we're still not really nearly where we were, um, you know, early in 2020. Uh, still a lot of testing happening. So over 6.6 .6 million PCR tests have been um, conducted. Uh, we're still seeing right around 20,000 tests being reported on a daily basis. Um, and then the other good news around PCR testing is that our percent of tests that are positive continues to decline. So we got up as high as, as almost 20% positivity over the last week. You can see now um, we are at below 10% over the last week, which is really our goal um, in the last days sitting at right around, last seven days sitting at right around 8% of tests that are positive. Um, we're still also doing a lot of antigen testing. So um, over 1.2 million antigen tests have been reported to us. I'm still seeing, you know, 60 to 70,000 plus tests being reported on a weekly basis. Um, and those tests are sitting at right around 5% positivity in the last week or so. Um, our deaths fortunately have started to, to plateau and decline. Um, this is a lagging indicator, so it took, you know, several weeks to a month longer uh, than our cases declining for us to really see our, tests, our deaths um, start to, to slow. Um, we're, we're probably going to break 11,000 deaths um, this week, um, and our overall case fatality rate is still at right around 1.4%. I will say this 30 day case fatality rate is, um, is, is skewed because of the lag in death reporting, um, because we, we see that it takes on average four to five weeks from when someone gets sick from COVID for them to die and then that death to be reported to us. And that's at a minimum. Um, but conversely, it doesn't take that long for cases to be reported that we have a mismatch between our cases, which have declined very precipitously and our deaths, which take longer to decline. So just be aware that this is artificially elevated um, as our case counts have come down so quickly. And then we do continue to see declining numbers of hospitalizations, uh, just over 1100 patients hospitalized with COVID across the state. And that represents about 10% of all hospitalized patients. So um, just a reminder uh, that we, we still have our uh, Swiss cheese defense model of all of these different measures that um, are so critically important in preventing spread of disease in our communities and across the state. Um, I do want to share just a couple updates from CDC and then just uh, an update on vaccination progress before I close. So many of you may have heard in the lay press in the last week or two that CDC released some data um, about how to maximize fit uh, with masks to improve performance. So this was really sort of asking the question, is double masking better than wearing a single mask? And, and really what it comes down to is that there is some benefit to wearing two masks, um, but, but really the benefit comes from there being a tighter seal. So I'll just sort of show you their data here really quickly. This is fairly busy, but if you really focus on um, the, the, the dark blue bar at the bottom of each of these groupings, which is when both parties were wearing a mask, um, we have an unknotted medical procedure mask. So that's like a surgical mask, double masking, and then um, a knotted or tucked medical procedure mask. And the idea there is just to close the gaps at this sort of cheek area. And really just what you see is that there's pretty substantial benefit to double masking or knotting that medical procedure mask, even just compared to wearing an unknotted medical procedure mask. So um, again, just really highlighting that while there's benefit to having material in front of your, your nose and mouth, if there's big gaps in those masks around your cheeks and chin and nose where particles can enter or escape, then it sort of, uh, negates some of the benefit, not all, but some of the benefit of, of being masked. So um, just wanted to share that data with the group. And then um, additionally, people may have heard uh, that CDC released some updated quarantine guidance in the last week or two around persons that are fully vaccinated. Uh, the state of Tennessee has adopted this guidance um, in alignment with CDC, um, but, but the, the high level summary is just that if you've been fully vaccinated, so that's more than two weeks after your second dose in the series, um, and it's been within three months of that, and you have an exposure to COVID and you remain asymptomatic, you don't have to quarantine. 
so there's a whole lot of other detail there. The, the full link is here and I'll of course share my slides with Tina to be sent out, but um, that is a recent change that I just wanted to highlight for everyone. And then just a few quick vaccine updates. So as a reminder, um, we still just have two vaccines with a um, current emergency use authorization, that's Pfizer and Moderna. However, Johnson & Johnson has filed their EUA and FDA is meeting, I believe on the 26th of February to review that data um, for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, the, the real kicker with J&J &J is that it's a single dose vaccine. So what I really wanna highlight, and I think this is such a powerful slide, um, you know, there's been a lot of coverage in the media about how Johnson & Johnson is a less effective vaccine. You know, the data from the United States um, I believe for, for all symptomatic infections was that it prevented about 72% of them, and that's compared to roughly 95% of infections being prevented, symptomatic infections being prevented by Pfizer or Moderna. Um, but again, it's one dose, not two. And so really the take home point here is that, you know, these are the, the numbers of participants in all of these trials. J&J &J was actually the largest uh, phase three clinical trial of any of them, and these are, the trials were, were double this size. These are just the number of people that receive vaccine. And for all of these different vaccines, among the people vaccinated, none of them were hospitalized with COVID. None of them died from COVID and none of them died from the vaccine, which is important to note. So, you know, I think we're all excited to have our mRNA vaccines that are so highly efficacious. Um, but remember, you know, at the end of the day here, the goal is really to prevent morbidity and mortality. And so if we can keep people out of the hospital and we can keep them dying from dying from COVID, that is hugely important. And so there is absolutely benefit to the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, and it is something that, um, you know, if, if it was me or my family and it was a matter of waiting months for another vaccine, I, I would, I would be, very willing to accept the J&J &J vaccine, knowing that it's gonna keep them out of the hospital and, and protect them from potentially having a very bad outcome. Um, so just a reminder of the, the vaccine allocation phases. Remember, we're doing the simultaneous age-based and risk-based approach. Um, we're at 70 plus in all of our counties now, um, and, uh, and certainly in phase 1A2 and, and 1B in many counties as well. So I expect there'll be some announcements about timelines for sort of the next groups statewide, probably later this week, <clears throat> um, depending on the weather and, um, on, and state functionality. Um, but, but this is the current phases as they exist. And then with regards to how vaccination rollout is going, uh, Tennessee has received about 1.2 million doses of vaccine and has administered um, this weekend, we crossed the 1 million um, doses threshold, which is just a huge accomplishment. Um, I can't say enough about our healthcare partners, our local health departments, so many people working incredibly hard um, to get access to, uh, to vaccines. So you can see here at the bottom, um, 1.026 million doses recorded, over 10% of our statewide population now has received at least one dose. Um, and you can see, uh, oh, so that, that's about, you know, 700,000 people um, and about 330,000 of them are fully vaccinated, um, have received both doses of vaccine. And then this is just a breakdown of demographics. I think this is helpful. Um, so you can just see again, huge focus on vaccinating the older population, um, you know, what is that, 48, 49% of all of our doses in the state have been given to persons over the age of 71. Um, so, you know, huge push there, real goal to try to protect that group that is just at such astronomically higher risk of hospitalization and death from COVID. Um, and a lot of focus on, of course, reaching um, vulnerable populations, about, you know, six and a half, seven percent of Tennesseans vaccinated are Black or African American, although they account for uh, you know, over 15% of our population. So lots of efforts and outreach there to reach groups that are, that are high risk. Um, so just sort of a high level overview of the rollout and what that has looked like and what we think that will look like heading into March. So, you know, in December, really vaccine was only positioned in hospitals and health departments. In January, that expanded a bit to include some independent pharmacies um, and some safety net clinics. 
in February, we expect that that um, that will expand uh, to potentially some schools. Um, Walmart has has been activated as a pharmacy partner, both at the federal and state level. So there are now hundreds of Walmarts across the state with vaccine access. There's discussion about federal mass vaccination sites, although that's not um, active yet. Uh, FEMA, uh, FEMA rather is providing some administrative support at some of our sites across the state, but we're not operating um, a, a large mass vac site from the federal government and the state yet. Um, and then looking forward, I think continuing to expand lots of ongoing discussions with the Tennessee Board of Regents and others, employee health clinics are, are in line to be onboarded um, as we just sort of continue to add to the menu of access options uh, that people have. Um, and just as a reminder, there are a lot of tools available on our website, both for tracking data, um, as well as related to vaccine eligibility uh, and the current vaccine phases. Um, we continue to have this map by county that shows the vaccine phase by the risk base. And if you click the tab at the top by the age based strata, um, lots of options to check this progress. Our vaccine data is updated daily now. And then you can see how Tennessee compares to other states um, at the CDC map. Um, I will also just highlight that there's a lot of data on the website around myths and misconceptions. So, um, you know, if you're getting questions from, from staff or employees or hearing rumblings of people that are mistrustful of vaccine. There's a lot of, of topics that are addressed um, on the website related to that. Um, and then, of course, finding your phase um, and an eligibility tool. Oh, and that's in there twice. Sorry, some duplications there. Um, and then a lot of other resources available. So um, happy to take any questions that folks have, uh, but hopefully that's a helpful update and overview. Thanks, Dr. Phil. I've got a couple just right off the top of my head. So what is the what's the vaccine supply looking like until Johnson Johnson comes aboard? Yeah, so we still don't have great long term visibility. Um, you know, we're now getting at least three weeks or so of of um, perspective at a time rather than living week to week. So, um, for example, a week or two ago, our allocation increased a little bit. Um, and we were told you can expect this to be stable for the next three weeks. Um, and we certainly don't expect that it's going to go down. So we expect to keep seeing increasing supply of the mRNA vaccines, although the degree to which is still unclear, um, especially if, uh, you know, there are some federal um, resources that are mobilized, <clears throat> you know, discussions about, you know, federal vaccination sites across the country. They have to pull a stockpile from somewhere. And so, um, you know, there's, it sort of remains to be seen how rapidly our supply will escalate, but we expect it to be stable or increasing going forward, even just with the two vaccines that we have now. And then, Will, when do you expect to be into uh, phase 2A? That's some time off, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I think it's really hard to predict. Um, you know, I, I know some folks at the federal level have indicated that by April, everyone that wants vaccine will be able to get vaccine. You know, I don't know that we see that. Maybe they have more information than we do, which is certainly possible. But, um, you know, I, again, we, we hope to continue to move quickly through the phases. Um, you know, there's been a really big push um, for access and uh, an outreach to the older population in the state. And I think to be frank, you know, we, we want to take our time and be really thorough with that population. I don't know that we will be as, um, I don't know. It's a lot easier to reach, um, you know, the majority of Tennesseans, many of whom have internet access and smartphones and all these things. And, than reaching our older population, which is a little bit harder, and we want to do our due diligence and make sure that if they're at home and, and don't have a um, have the internet or or have a smartphone, that they can still <laughs> sign up and get access to vaccines. So, um, so all that being said, I don't have an exact timeline. I think, um, like I said, there should be an announcement later this week about sort of moving to the next age and risk based phases, and um, and then I think. A lot of it just depends on how quickly that supply increases um, from the federal government. 
um, versus it staying relatively stable and, and, and how quickly, even if, if J&J is approved, um, you know, how quickly that means the supply is available for you. So I still think things are looking optimistic to move very quickly into the spring. Um, but, but the next couple of months are still a little bit uncertain um, until we have a better sense about that, that timeline. Is it, is it 70 plus in all counties now? Yes, sir. Okay. You know, I, I've heard all kinds of stories and, and didn't have that good of ex experience getting my, my own mother-in-law vaccinated, but I guess in, in all Tennessee's done as well as any state really, right? Even with- I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I think we've done a really good job about trying to maintain our prioritization. You know, we could, we could probably vaccinate more people faster if we just opened up, you know, huge stadium sites in Knoxville and Nashville and Memphis and said, best of luck um, and let, you know, it be a free for all. Um, but it's, it's not just about the numbers. It's about making sure that you're reaching the right people. Um, and so I think we've, we've, we've really tried to do our due diligence and, and prioritize those groups and ensure access to the priority groups. Um, and also, you know, Tennessee is very different from a lot of states and that, while we do have, you know, focused populations or larger populations in some parts of the state, you know, half of our of our population is in rural counties. And so, you know, we can't assume that people are going to drive, you know, two hours to Nashville or, um, you know, an hour and a half or, or even half an hour to somewhere to get vaccinated. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to ensure um, equitable access across the state, um, you know, to, to the priority groups as we cross those different phases. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're assuming in, in, in discussions with Dr. Dunn that when 2A do, does come, that's going to include about anybody and everybody related to food production, distribution, et cetera, correct? Yes, sir. Correct. In, including vets, farmers, uh, our, our food inspect, food and dairy inspectors, et cetera? Yeah, I think um, I, I, we can circle offline commissioner with Dr. Dunn and make sure that we're all on the same page. I don't want to speak yes. um, out of turn, but um, that's, that's my understanding. And I think, you know, certainly anything touching the, the food production industry in any way uh, will fall yeah. into that category. Well, there, they must be expecting a lot of vaccine to dump. I heard Dr. Fauci say, when, and usually pretty conservative, he said by yeah. April, anybody that might want it could get it potentially. So it's yes, things sir. <laughs> must change rap, going to change rapidly. I don't know where all the yeah, you know, we've, we've heard, yeah, you know, we've we've heard from Pfizer that they're you know in the process of of ramping up and. Um, you know, the, the administration secured an additional, I think, 200 million doses, but many of those won't be available until July. So, you know, I think, um, again, the, the, it's coming. I think just the exact time frame of that is a little bit unclear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Right. Wells, and this is Jennifer. I've got a question on as we move into the risk-based phases. What it is, what's the requirement like proving you have pre existing conditions or proving you're an ag worker who doesn't necessarily have a, like a hospital name ID tag? Yeah, so in general, we haven't had strict require. like, obviously, we, it's, it's um, sort of good faith. So I, I would say you don't have to bring documentation from your primary care doctor that you have multiple comorbidities. I think having in your brain what those comorbidities are if, if asked to share is helpful, but there's no formal documentation required. And similarly, you know, if you have any sort of, you know, work badge or something, um, you know, about being an agriculture worker that you could bring that that could be helpful, but we, in general, we're not turning people away. Um, if, and we're not requiring that people meet, you know, strict requirement thresholds. You know, I, I think we also recognize that many people working in agriculture and some of our, you know, processing plants are, um, you know, uh, some of them might not have a driver's license. And uh, and so, you know, we, we don't want that to be a barrier for people to not be vaccinated. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, and the, the overarching message from the commissioner down has been, uh, you know, to, to trust what people are telling you 
Does that mean that some people are abusing the system? Yes, absolutely it does, but we would rather allow some cases of abuse where folks get vaccinated early and, uh, you know, the, the worst case scenario is that someone that maybe isn't as high risk is getting a vaccine earlier than they should versus someone that truly is high risk, either for bad outcomes or for infection, is unable to get vaccinated because they can't meet the proof of, of uh, you know, of whatever it may be. So, so we've erred on the side of just being trusting of people um, not gaming the system, although, you know, we know that that's happening on occasion, but there's no indication that that's a widespread problem. Hey, one, one last question. There, a fellow showed up at, at the front door of my office asking for leftover vaccine. Can you, can you tell us what, do they have <laughs> leftover vaccine at the end of the day? Uh, so, you know, most health departments have a system in place. You know, we're all trying to operate under an appointment system for that very reason. You know, many of these vaccines, Pfizer in particular, but Moderna as well, you know, once you saw them, you only have a certain amount of time for them to be administered. And so, um, you know, that's that's a large reason why it hasn't just been like a free for all first come first serve is we really want to know how many people are expected to be vaccinated each day. But there are always people that don't show up or things that happen especially with the crazy weather of recent. So um, on occasion, uh, you know, there may be vaccine that's left over, but all of our health departments and the metros as well have, have systems in place, either sort of lottery systems or, or wait lists where they can work off of those to reach people that could be there, you know, within 30 minutes or an hour or whatever the time frame may be uh, to be vaccinated. Um, the, the goal is to stay in phase with those if we can. Um, but if it's, you know, a half a dozen doses at the end of the day, then, you know, we'd rather get that vaccine in someone's arm than it go in the garbage, even if that person isn't currently in phase. Okay. All right. Sorry for all the questions. We better move on then. So, no so worries. We're good. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have uh, Shannon Klonowski up next. She's our Assistant Commissioner and Chief Financial Officer, and she's uh, Larry Maxwell's uh, upgraded version so good to see you this morning shannon good morning commissioner can you hear me all right yes okay well let's go over some of the budget highlights um the governor's budget came out um with the state of the state um overall um i think we've had more revenues than anybody expected which is great news for the state um, but that doesn't mean that we're going to go ahead and spend it like we've got it. Um, the governor's taking a very cautious approach to this, um, which is good. Um, so that that's kind of the whole theme throughout the budget that's been proposed. Um, we've taken a look at a lot of things that are what we call um, non-recurring items. So things like infrastructure, capital maintenance, um, broadband, kind of a one time you pay it once for this year and it does not recur any year thereafter. So we're, we're being very cautious about it. Um, I do wanna point out that Tennessee is currently ranked by the US News and World Report as the number one state for fiscal stability. Uh, we are very proud of that. We are fiscally conservative and we hold that near and dear to our hearts. Um, and again, the, the governor's office will tell you, this is not the work of just one person. This is the work of all of us collectively. So. Um, that, that's great news for our state, and we have held on to that ranking again this year. Um, this is the largest budget in state history. It's $41.8 in total. Uh, we have put $50 million into the Rainy Day Fund, and with a, now a record high of $1.5 billion, and also 10 care reserves are at $500 million. So our state is sitting great, financially speaking, um, and we should all be very proud of this. Just a few things to point out from the governor's overall budget before I step into agriculture specific items. Um, the governor has proposed, these are all non-recurring items. So this means just a one time, um, just this next year kind of a payment. Uh, 200 million for broadband to get broadband out to all of our rural communities. The governor recognizes how important this is. There's 800, I'm sorry, 85 million proposed for short line railroad grants. And I know that's very important to agriculture and getting commodities moved. Uh, 95 million in non-recurring to the fast track program in ECD, economic and community development. That'll help getting jobs into our state. 
uh, 21.1 million non-recurring for grants and services to assist our rural communities and distressed counties. And then uh, 200 million for local infrastructure grant program um, for governments recovering and rebuilding in response to COVID-19. So there's a lot of money that we're trying to get out into the rural communities and all the communities in our state. Looking at just agriculture um, and our budget, just to kind of paint a picture for you real quick. Our total budget at the Department of Agriculture is $121.5 million this year. It's funded um, by state dollars of 88 million, federal dollars of 14.2 million, and other of uh, 19.1 million. That other consists of current services, interdepartmental, things like that. So, um, like I said, our total is 121.5 million, and we have a staff of 728 employees currently. So, as we went through um, agriculture's budget, uh, the reductions that were taken totaled $3.195 million um, from our 12% reductions that we proposed. We had a number of reduction proposals going on this year thanks to COVID. Um, we were trying to be very safe and conservative and make sure that we weren't overspending to close the year. So uh, we had about $3 million from that and $152 million, I'm sorry, $152,000 from our 2% reductions. Throughout all of our reductions, I'm not gonna go into them in details because there's there's quite a few, but our goal at the department was to make sure that we could maintain our services and operations and not change those. And we feel like we have been able to successfully do this. Um, if you're interested in details of this, you can always reach out and I'll be happy to talk budget with you anytime. Um, but then the cost increases for the department, um, we had $242,000 for a One Health initiative. And I know this is near and dear to Commissioner's heart, uh, making sure that we are monitoring animal diseases that could potentially over to human diseases. So I think COVID is our perfect example right now. Um, $312,200 for some forestry software for helping to um, track with our firefighting efforts. Um, we also had $5.5 million for our Ag Enhancement Program. Um, this is obviously our big, uh, probably most well known department. This is something we had asked for before COVID hit. And um, because COVID hit, everything was kind of thrown off the table and we all kind of reined in. Um, so we're very glad that this is back on the table. And this is a recurring item for us. So that money will be there year after year. It's very exciting. Um, and then there's also 5.25 million for the state fair. Um, in addition, we've got kind of floating out there, we, uh, 1.25 million for a radio replacement for our forestry staff so we can maintain communications. When those cell phone towers go down, it's imperative that we can still communicate with our dozer operators and frontline firefighters. So um, we've got an item in there for 1.25 million. On the capital side, um, like I said, the governor's really focused on capital improvements and kind of catching up on some deferred maintenance that's been out there for a number of years. So for agriculture, our capital total budget this year will be $8.2 million. Um, it's $3.4 million for maintenance. That includes if you've um, a Chickasaw culvert project, there's a bridge where the culvert needs to be replaced desperately. And then our ten East Tennessee nursery, nursery, where we grow our seedlings, has a bit of a drainage problem. Uh, we are unable to cross some of the roads in our nursery to tend to our seedlings. So that was included, and we're very happy to see that. Um, our, we have $4 million for the Standing Stone Work Center. Forestry has really been making a concentrated effort to um, consider forestry work centers across the state. So we're building one new work center and consolidating three or four in the surrounding area so that we we don't have to rebuild all of these work centers. Uh, we're trying to be most efficient with the capital dollars that we get. So we will have a new work center coming at Standing Stone. And then there's $850,000 for demolition of structures, some things that just need to be taken care of. Um, overall, I would say it's certainly been a tough year. There's no doubt about it. It has been a budget year like none other. Um, but we were very, very pleased with the governor's budget. Um, it certainly highlights his support for the agriculture community. And we are very thankful for that relationship and his understanding of how important agriculture and forestry communities are. 
Um, so I guess at the end of the day, when this budget is all said and done, we are very fortunate. And Commissioner, I will hand it back over to you unless there's any questions. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, we'll move to uh, Keith. Can you hear me, Commissioner? Yes. Very good. Uh, to quote Dr. Phil, uh, you know, I'm always battling broadband issues in Watertown. So uh, appreciate her and her great report a moment ago. Uh, want to talk a little bit today about the Coronavirus Agriculture and Forestry Business Fund. Of course, as a review, we've been allocated 55 million for over 700 recipients of which 30 million of that 55 was allocated for business disruption. Our business consulting team continues to work with Horn and the recipients so that the requests for funds are being processed as quickly as possible. As a reminder, the deadline for business disruption claims is February the 28th, and the deadline for supply chain enhancement claims is May the 31st. Businesses are required to prove their net business disruption losses uh, in 2020 as opposed to 2019. And many recipients are also receiving funding, uh, who have also received funding from federal sources like PPP loans or USDA CFAP money, monies. Uh, we're of course making them aware that guidelines from the U.S. Department of Treasury specify that the amounts received from these other programs must be deducted from our program's allocation for business disruption. And as you might imagine, this has led to frustration among recipients. However, our team is working very closely with these recipients, having webinars daily to assist them in providing information to the accountants at Horn to, in order to prove their losses. And as of today, Horn has approved approximately $27.2 million. That's 49%, 49.5% of the 55 million that's in the hands of recipients. And we're very pleased with that. Um, we have some big news this week on Pick Tennessee products. Uh, consumer interest in purchasing local is at an all-time high, and the long-standing Pick Tennessee Products program is announcing a refreshed logo for food businesses and farmers markets and agritourism. We're very excited to bring forward this new look to our agricultural marketing program. Through an online directory, a mobile app, the program continues to give consumers uh, opportunity to make their direct-to-farm connection. And this has been going on for over 30 years that we connected folks everywhere uh, with Tennessee food and farm businesses. And we now have over 2,700 farmers and direct and farm direct businesses listed on our directories. Uh, we're working very closely with Extension and the local leadership too in the Pikeville Bledsoe County area to assist Avigen in sourcing corn from local farmers at their new feed mill. Their Avigen is very interested in establishing supply agreements with farmers to source um, much of their, low, their corn that you're gonna need in their feed mill locally. Their preference is to get corn grown as close to the feed mill as possible. However, to accommodate year round production, they're willing to work with farmers within a reasonable distance of their operation. And uh, they're very interested in working with farmers that are utilizing irrigation as well as have on, -star, on farm uh, storage capacity to accommodate year round scheduling. And interested farmers, we're having a, a, a webinar on February the 23rd next week to discuss this further with them and this opportunity. And I wanna say a word about the Ag Enhancement Program. Uh, we're approaching our livestock equipment reimbursement deadline of April the 1st. Several producers and equipment de uh, retailers have contacted us with back order concerns and just always rest assured that we'll work with farmers to resolve these opportunities. And we encourage farmers, however, not to wait until the last minute to make their purchasing decisions. Remember, used equipment now in Ag Enhancement has to have an age requirement of 10 years or less and this new rule was recommended by our Ag Enhancement Advisory Committee with the goal of improving the quality of used equipment purchasing purchased under the cost share. We approved 7,326 applications this year. We processed 565 and we've already got 1.4 million out in reimbursed to farmers across the state. And finally, uh, on March the 5th, uh, we're working with several industry partners to put on the Mid-South Agriculture Trade Conference. It'll be a webinar to help inform farmers, agribusiness, and agricultural leaders in Tennessee and the Mid-South about the role and the significance of international trade 
on local agriculture production markets and economies and to hopefully increase the awareness of agriculture and forestry exporting tools and resources. I'll be, uh, I'll be posting our telephone number of business development here in a moment in the chat, but that's my report, Commissioner, and appreciate the opportunity to be part of this, uh, this webinar. Thanks, Keith. I'm looking for uh, Aaron Smith. Aaron, are you on? I am, Commissioner. Can you hear me? I can. I don't know why I didn't see you listed there, but go ahead. Good to have you. All right, can you see my screen good? Yes, sir. Excellent. Well, I'm going to provide just a quick update on a couple of things, but most of my time I do want to focus on a couple of new um, pieces of information that we've been, been working on, uh, namely feed costs and then looking out towards uh, spring planting for our primary row crops. So when we end up uh, looking, this kind of um, hammers home the point that John made earlier in the call, where we look at our unemployment rate in Tennessee at the end of uh, December, it was estimated at 6.4%. Um, you know, obviously we're still substantially higher than where we were before all of this occurred. Um, and we are lagging a little bit, um, you know, a little bit higher than where we were even back in November. So again, we are uh, uh, at a point where uh, hopefully we can start seeing some movement on that, but a lot of that will be tied to the, uh, the hospitality industry, as well as, uh, as some of the other uh, industries that were hit hardest. When we look at kind of uh, trends in, in, in food service and drinking places, unfortunately the last three months, so October, November, and December, we did see a, a decrease uh, across the US. A lot of that is tied to you know, additional concerns uh, in, in numerous states. Uh, obviously, you know, there's been certain states that have had much more um, extensive lockdowns, and that's obviously shown in, in kind of regional data. When we look quickly at prices, uh, we have seen, this is uh, Tennessee weekly weighted average prices for steers and heifers, uh, multiple weights here where we got a price at about 155, uh, for for four or five weights, um, you know, about 121 for for seven eight weights, and then heifers are are a little bit lower than that. When we look at uh, hog futures, we've seen a dramatic increase in in prices uh, since uh, the start of the new year. You know, obviously we're we're closely looking at uh, uh, African swine fever and export demand. A big uh, push will be how much China ends up buying. But the one that I do want to focus on this cuts across not just hogs but cattle, poultry. Uh, and dairy is the increased feed costs. We've seen nearby uh, milk futures kind of hovering around that 16 to $17 range. But this is kind of where we, we've seen uh, a dramatic increase on our input costs uh, for livestock production. Corn DDG is up 52% over last year from 160 to 243. This coincides with ethanol production being down 9.3%. And you can see there was uh, this coinciding co uh, decrease in ethanol production and that spike in, in feed, but or in DDG price. But again, what we're looking at is where we're head, we're trending in 2021 and these much higher cost structures potentially. When we look at soybean meal price, um, again, what you see is a 45% increase from the same time last year from 308 to 447. Um, and I have heard a few claims from people about access, access and availability issues with soybean meal. So again, that's something that, that can be problematic. When we look at uh, cottonseed meal up 82% compared to last year, you know, up to 460 uh, from 253 compared to the last year. So these rising feed costs, obviously we like to see higher prices. But again, when we have the inputs rising rapidly as well, that can end up tightening those margins substantially. When we look at corn and, and soybean prices, I don't think this is going to surprise a lot of people in terms of cash prices. We're close to $14 in, in Tennessee and $563 for corn. Tremendous variability across the state with some uh, regions being higher than, uh, than those in terms of what the basis is being paid. When we look at cash prices for, for cotton and wheat, cotton's really exploded. Uh, up to almost 90 cents uh, in terms of cash prices. Wheat's moved sideways pretty much most of this month, kind of in that 630 uh, uh, to 650 range. One thing that does concern me about the rapid increases in, in uh, futures, and I use corn as an example here, but this is prevalent in a lot of our, our futures markets right now, is this black line shows the managed money. So it, basically speculative money in futures markets and how it's contributed to the price run-up. And again, it's maybe not 
dictating the trend, but it is accentuating it. And you can see over time, when we see these money flows, it will typically end up resulting in uh, an accelerated downtrend when markets do end up turning. So again, it doesn't speak to when these markets will move. It just ends up speaking to that we might see an acceleration based on participation of speculative money across a lot of our agricultural markets. When we look at crop insurance prices for, for, for uh, our pr principal row crops, this is a very good um, story. We see cotton currently right now, obviously we're not done the price determination period. It won't close until February 28th, but cotton at 81 cents, corn at 451 and soybeans at 1166. These would be the highest crop insurance prices, spring crop insurance prices since 2013 or 14, depending on the commodity. And again, that equals a higher revenue guarantee. You can see compared to last year, how big of a difference we've ended up having when in 2020 it was 68 cents for cotton, 388 for corn and 917 for, for soybeans. So this is potentially a completely different revenue price risk profile for our primary row crop producers in, in 2020 because of the, the safety net that this can end up providing our producers. So this is a real positive as we enter the planting season. So when we look at plantings, obviously we've got uh, numerous things that can continue to affect uh, what plantings are doing nationally. You can see the, the, the maximum acres that we've planted since 2000 for corn, soybeans and cotton. And where we're estimating right now is somewhere in that 87 to 94 million acres of corn and soybeans uh, nationally, and then 12.5 to 13.5 million acres of cotton, which is up pretty substantially from where the, the National Cotton Council survey was. But again, you have to remember we've added almost 10 cents to our harvest contract um, after they they received those survey results. So when we look specifically to Tennessee, just a quick breakdown of, of Tennessee agricultural land, about 10.874 million acres. Of that 5.2 is, is crop, but there is hay embedded in that. So when we look at Tennessee planted acres, obviously this is kind of what we're looking at over, over 2006 to 2020, the max and min for each commodity. Then we look out to 2021, you know, I think we will be up across um, all three primary spring crops, corn at 965, cotton at 325, soybeans uh, just under 1.7, and hay down a little bit. Again, you know, spring planting conditions are going to dictate where we see these acreage, acreage go. Um, so we'll have to end up seeing how, how things go, but there is definitely an incentive to plant some of our, our primary row crops. You know, cotton's really come on strong and corn and soybeans the prices have been really good. You know, paying attention to local basis is, is really important when you're evaluating relative profitability for these, these commodities. But the price incentive is definitely there on the row crop side of things. It's not perfect though. One thing that has uh, crept into it on the input cost side uh, is on the fertilizer. Uh, we've seen a dramatic run up in the price of some of our fertilizers. I've got DAP, MAP, Potash and Urea. You can see over the last two months, we've seen a tremendous increase in what our prices have been uh, for fertilizer. So hopefully uh, people pre-booked or a lot of producers pre-booked some of their, their inputs because we have seen this continue to go up as we've seen the acceleration in commodity prices. When you look at liquid fertilizers, again, we have seen those increases, but not as dramatically as some of our pre-plant and planting products that we're putting down. So just in closing thoughts, um, you know, economic uncertainty in the U.S. and global economies will continue uh, through the end of the second quarter, at least, and, and perhaps beyond. Uh, commodity markets are likely to remain volatile early in, in 2021, as we see where planting intentions end up coming out. Um, how, what ends up happening down in South America is going to dictate uh, some of our prices. And then China, across pretty much all commodities, is that big unknown. I'm very interested to hear uh, some of the speakers at the Mid-South Trade. Uh, virtual program because I think there'll be some fantastic insights there that we can end up looking at. Row crop pricing opportunities have been really good uh, so far. And then when we look at uh, livestock and crop inputs, those are up substantially. So again, managing those input costs is gonna be critical to profitability as we move through 2021. And I swear I didn't steal this from John, but I will will kind of echo what he said. Overall for 2021, um, the outlook is cautiously optimistic. There's some some good things happening. There's obviously some, some pretty big challenges as well, but uh, at the same time, I think uh, we're positioned 
reasonably well to have a, a successful 2021. We'll have to see how the, the weather cooperates and how some of the other factors influence uh, the season as we move along. With that, Commissioner, that is all I have. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. And as always, we'll distribute these slides uh, so the group can take a look at the numbers. Well, thank you, Dr. Smith. Those feed costs are going to start getting into the pocketbook for those feed and livestock, aren't they? Yeah, they've really moved. Like, it's been a pretty big run up. Uh, same with the fertilizer side of things. So, again, you know, one thing that we are looking at is kind of obviously supply and demand is playing a, an important role there. But, uh, you know, have we seen a, a, a change in any of the cost structure of the large distributions um, for some of these industries as a result of, you know, COVID and, and kind of some of the transportation issues? We yeah. haven't really dug into that, but it's something to worth noting. Okay, thank you much. I see Jeff Aiken. Jeff, you're about as casual as I've ever seen you. What's up with that? We have snow and ice this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does Redonna know you don't have a tie on? I hope not. <laughs> Good morning, sir. And, uh, Good morning. To everyone on the call, uh, to follow up on Dr. Schiff's comments, uh, we're, we're optimistic for 2021 as well, obviously, uh, for, for many reasons, but we'll be celebrating our 100th anniversary at the Farm Bureau, and uh, we're excited over that, and we'll be uh, having celebrations throughout the year to uh, in recognition of that. But uh, I'll be very brief with my report. Uh, j just last week, we uh, had the opportunity to present a Kubota tractor to Kerry Robertson, uh, second place winner in the uh, Young Farmer contest last year, and in uh, uh, we'll soon be presenting one to Case IH to Hunter and Laura Grills. Uh, I guess I would share with this group, if, if you're aware of any uh, deserving young farmers, uh, please uh, send them to their local farm bureau or, or let some of us know applications for this year's contest are due May the 15th, and we'd like to uh, recognize uh, worthy young farmers for, for the impact that they're making. This Friday and Saturday, uh, the Council of Cooperatives will be uh, hosting the Young Leaders Conference uh, in Cool Springs, uh, weather permitting. And uh, I think there's uh, a little over 200 that have registered to come to that. Uh, and we'll be following uh, COVID guidelines, um, but it looks like it should be a good conference if we're able to have it. Uh, uh, UT Martin Chancellor uh, Keith Carver is on the program, and uh, I guess the first time that our new extension dean at the University of Tennessee, Dr. Ashley Stokes, will will make a public appearance. She is uh, slated to speak there as well. The other thing that I'll mention, uh, we're having an Ag Industry Partner Meeting uh, on February the 25th at the Farm Bureau Expo Building in Wilson County, and. Uh, some of the topics that we expect to discuss there are mental health uh, for agriculture folks during COVID, uh, education issues, ag workforce, and ag economy. Commissioner, I'll stop there, but happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Thank you for allowing me to give an update. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I do see uh, Zach and his cowboy hat on there. I'm glad you could join us. And it's a good thing you did, because Andy Holt was going to try to give your update because he had a cowboy hat on. I don't. It wouldn't have been too good, I wouldn't think. But hi, Commissioner. I, you know, I apologize. I didn't. I didn't think I was going to be able to make the call with Winter Policy Conference coming, but I, I I called in a few minutes ago and I was like, oh man, I should I should I should hop on and and try to give you all an update. Um, we're kind of in a crazy holding pattern here uh, because of the impeachment trial. Now that that is over, uh, we expect the uh, Secretary Vilsack will be confirmed uh, really quickly. Um, you know, hopefully as early as um, you know, maybe the beginning of next week. Um, and once that happens, there are a lot of budgetary items that are already moving through the reconciliation process. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, inside knowledge currently on the state and local government funding. Um, that's obviously been a bargaining chip um, between the two parties, and I think that's something that we're gonna be closely monitoring. Um, we There was some money appropriated, as you guys all know, from uh, the last bill that was passed that the current administration, uh, farmer uh, mental health and especially crop block grant 
uh, funds that will uh, be going out and we'll be getting additional guidance on that as well. Um, you know, most of the things that we've seen so far from the administration really focus on climate change. Uh, we've seen a lot of executive orders there. Uh, we've also looked, uh, we've seen a lot on the diversity and inclusion uh, work as well. Um, still waiting for a bunch of the undersecretary nominees. Um, I would encourage any of you that uh, are going to be attending the winter policy conference. Uh, we, we do have um, Deputy Undersecretary Stacey Dean. Uh, she'll be speaking at the food systems and nutrition um, panel. A uh, great opportunity to you know, have an introduction with some of the new leadership at USDA. Um, Commissioner, happy to, to speak on anything specifically that you have in mind, but th that's kind of where we're at uh, for, you know, uh, right now. I think next month. I'm going to have a lot to report. I, I think a lot's going to happen in the next four weeks now that we got past the impeachment and we're going to start seeing things move to a probe. We're going to start seeing things, new people come to the administration and we're going to see the reconciliation process start working its way through. Yeah, I was yeah. glad to see uh, Jewel Braunau nominated for deputy. That's that's uh, that's fantastic. She, she's already been engaged. Uh, she's been mm -hmm. on a couple calls with us already. Um, NAS has already had a couple conversations with Secretary Bill Sack. Um, I know um, in my role as leading the uh, the FACA, the Food and Agricultural Climate Alliance, and the NRE policy for NAS, uh, we've had a lot of engagement with the Hill, both Republicans and Democrats, and um, we've already had some great conversations with the um, with the administration. Again, another shameless plug: if you're interested in the carbon markets and climate change, we're going to have a Professor. Jonathan Copas, who had worked under the Obama administration, who's a professor of law at uh, the University of Illinois, who has been one of the leading scholars on carbon banks and carbon sequestration funding. Uh, he's going to be speaking at the Natural Resources and Environment Policy Committee um, at, at Winter Policy Conference. So uh, you highly promote that if you're interested in what this uh, new green bank carbon bank may look like that we're going to see out of the new administration, most likely. That company, I had heard that there there's a department wide or I guess administration wide freeze on some program funding. Is that is that true or is that and how long will that last? Yeah, I don't um my understanding is it's most of the things that you're you know we're using a lot of different words. Freezes, you know, some people are being a little bit more aggressive. My understanding is all the things that we're seeing in terms of rules and a lot of the program stuff is common practice. You're, you had things that were getting ready to go out that the new administration put, you know, the words that we've heard most common is a pause. They're just doing the last checks off. But the example that I most commonly use is the hemp rule. Um, Bill Richmond was kind enough to do a, um, uh, a briefing for the hemp regulators group. And, you know, uh, they're basically uh, hoping that this is just going to be a check off and the, the group will get this out. And he will be speaking at our plant pesticide um, committee meeting at Winter Policy Conference. Um, the quote unquote worst case scenario is it would go out for a 130 day comment period. Um, but, you know, I, I think most of it is that this isn't, um, you know, uh, call for uh, dramatic alarm, at least in my policy areas. You know, I know uh, the animal ag stuff, something you're really passionate about. So if there's a specific program that you're nervous about, you're worried about, have to follow up with our team on it. But in my, in my policy areas, there hasn't been anything. Um, to be alarmed about just yet. Okay, and that's that's not unusual to do that with an incoming administration anyhow, so. All right, I think we have, uh, yes, we do. Uh, Ty Samples, Acting Director FSA is on. Ty? Yes, thank you. Hi, thank you, Commissioner Hatcher. Um, and just wanted to just introduce myself to the group. I'll be serving as the Acting State Executive Director director until such time as a new director is named. Uh, we are also going to continue on with our existing state committee until we get a new committee. So they will also be assisting me with uh, program administration and continuation um, during this interim period. Um, as of right now, our offices are still closed to the public as far as in-person visits, but we still remain open across our 59 locations to service our customers. Uh, via phone or email. They can also drop off uh, paperwork if need be. We've uh, put out a lot of drop boxes on the front door of our offices to assist with that process. 
Uh, we are, again, awaiting guidance from our department as far as any updates to our office statuses and how we safely open to the public. So more to come in our future meeting. Um, as far as program related information, we're still very busy with multiple signups. Um, our coronavirus food assistance program, also known as SAP, uh, that deadline is approaching on February 26th. We're still accepting applications. However, due to change in administration, um, there is a regulatory review going on, just a brief pause before payments are released. So again, we are accepting applications through the 26th. Um, as far as our quality, quality loss adjustment program, um, that sign up deadline is coming up on March 5th. And we do have a, a several applications coming through for that as well. Uh, WIP Plus is currently closed to enrollment, but we do have uh, over 600 applications that we're in the process of reviewing at this time. Um, NAP sales closing dates, uh, we have upcoming for um, vegetable crops, the closing sale date will be March 15th. Uh, grazing and forage just closed yesterday on the 15th. In reference to our conservation reserve program, um, our general sign-up deadline has been extended. Um, the deadline was previously scheduled for February 12th, but we've just had an open period where that deadline is now extended, um, hopefully to get some new enrollments there. In reference to ARC PLC, um, that deadline is fastly approaching for March 15th for 2021 enrollment, and that is open for anyone who wants to make an enrollment or an election change. And that is required for any um, participation for our 2021 crop programs. Otherwise, um, that's pretty much our updates for program related items. But as you can see, we're still very busy, um, even in this virtual environment. And I'll just open it up if you have any questions, but thank you. We can't see you there. Let me see if I can, oops, I'm sorry about that. Let me see if I can put my video on here. I'm echoing a little bit. Hey, Ty. Can you see me? Yeah, there Dale you Barnett, go. Tennessee Poultry. Hi. Yes. Hey, yeah, thank you for everything. Has, uh, and I may have just missed it. I was trying to multitask there. Uh, <laughs> has the new deadline been set for the, uh, uh, the CFAP2 program that contract growers can sign up for? Um, as as far as I know, it has not yet been said. We do have just a deadline for uh, February 26th coming up, but I will check with our. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we appreciate all that you're thank doing you. during this interim. Yeah, thanks, Ty. That was a very thorough report. Let's see, I think uh, we also have Dan Beasley, Acting Director, Rural Development. Dan, are you on? I am on, Commissioner. Good to see you again. Yes. Well, to give you an update on rural development, we're like FSA, we're waiting on Secretary to be confirmed. We've got uh, hopefully undersecretaries coming as well, and then state directors at some point, which will uh, give us a new state director for the state. We had a big year last year, as uh, many of you are aware, we had about 1.4 billion in overall activity for Tennessee. Our programs, the three big programs, housing, business, and utilities, uh, looking to be in 21, another big year right now. We've we've got about a million dollars that's been obligated so far in the CP program, our community program, that's our utility program. We're expecting about 200 million before the end of the fiscal year. In our um, in our business programs, we, we've, we're off to a real big start there. We've got about 42 million that's been obligated in our guaranteed loans. Uh, that's a, a significant increase from over last year. We're probably going to have a, a really large year in that. We've also got uh, the REAP program. That's the, the energy programs where we do a lot of the grant loan funding as it relates to uh, energy projects. Uh, we've got that program this year that's off to a good start as well. Uh, we've got deadlines that are upcoming and that I'll have to get you that information on when that is. But right now it should be probably sometime in early spring. And then the value added grant program, which is another farm related program that we administer. Uh, it's probably got deadlines coming as well and in, in uh, probably early spring and we'll get you some information on that next report. On our uh, housing side, we're looking again to be a huge year there. 
We're already almost 400 million in guaranteed housing loans that have been obligated across the state. So we're probably going to be somewhere in the 1.4 to 1.3 billion dollar range again this fiscal year as it relates to our, our housing and, and overall program activity. So only one other thing to pass on the uh, rural development conference that we uh, sponsor in conjunction with TVA and state ECD. Uh, that's been postponed this fiscal year in 21. We'll, we're looking to do spring of 22 now. So that's where we're at on that. And that's all I've got as far as the update is concerned. If you've got any questions, I'll try and get you some answers. Thank you, Dan. And I see Sheldon. Sheldon, you have, you've got a tie. Don't you have a tie on? Yeah. Yes, 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 sir, Commissioner Hatcher. I'll, I'll uh, Looking pull the good camera there. down a little bit. <laughs> Hey, well, thanks for allowing us to be on the call, Commissioner, and and, and good morning to everyone else who's on the call. Uh, Commissioner, as far as operations, I mean, we're still operating. Uh, our offices are closed to the public at this time. The department is um, working on a new playbook, so they have put a pause on, um, you know, moving offices to various phases right now until we get the new playbook. So, um, so that's kind of where we're at, and we're still functioning as an agency. Um, I would like to provide kind of an update and. Uh, as far as our NRCS office at national headquarters there in DC. So Terry Cosby, the state conservation Ohio is, is serving as our acting uh, NRCS chief right now. Um, Kevin Norton as our associate chief for NRCS is now serving as the undersecretary for farm production and business conservation, where our, um, basically the position Bill Northey held uh, previously. And so we have a little bit of change of the guards here. And then also Gail Berry, the deputy state conservationist in California is also um, serving as the acting associate chief for NRCS. Um, one exciting thing we do have uh, with, with the retirement of Robert Anderson, our state conservation engineer, we do have an acting state conservation engineer that started today, um, Dan Stageland. He's, out of, uh, he's a civil engineer out of Madisonville, Kentucky. So um, we're, we're happy to have him on board and kind of help with our engineering efforts here in Tennessee. Um, one big thing that the department and, and our national office is pushing is our conservation planning process. We, uh, we have uh, five key national partners that we're working with as far as our National Association of Conservation District, our conservation state agencies, our, our National District Employees Association, also our National uh, Resource Conservation Development. And the focus is, is trying to reinvigorate conservation planning by enhancing and strengthening effectiveness of planning and also our partnership workforce. And this planning, conservation planning is our roadmap. It's a nine-step planning process as we work with our producers across Tennessee and also allows, uh, you know, further when we have a great plan and we're able to address those resource concerns lead into uh, a potential uh, a farm bill contract. So um, soon our, our, our conservation uh, leaders, ag leaders across Tennessee will meet here soon to kind of talk about an action plan that we'll have to submit to our, our national office. So uh, just, we'll keep you informed on that. We do have um, uh, John uh, McClurkin as part of that team as well too, Commissioner. As um, far as um, field work, we continue to do our field work. Um, we have processed a little over 2,800 uh, payments for about $21 million. Our Environmental Quality Incentive Program uh, funding for FY21 is, is about uh, 27.2 million. We'll have an opportunity to request additional funds uh, in the near future. We are excited about a new joint uh, landscape restoration partnership that we have in East Tennessee, as um, far as looking at uh, at-risk species. And so that funding we received was a little over $700,000. So excited about that. And then also uh, a new program that we're gonna be working on is the EQIP Conservation uh, Incentive Contract. And the purpose of this program is kind of to provide stewardship opportunities for producers through EQIP based on addressing at least one priority resource concern and an identified watershed. So it allows the producer to implement elements uh, similar to the conservation stewardship program on a small scale, payments for adopting conservation practice, and also payment for managing and maintaining and also improving incentive practices. So uh, each state were to set aside about 5% of their funding um, or 200,000, whichever is greater, but Tennessee is gonna set aside about 1.2 million for this new program. Um, one thing I'll announce, uh, our competitive funding agreement state for our state uh, competitive funding announcements, we're looking at announcing that in March, and we're going to focus on urban uh, conservation projects such as pollinators, community gardens, um, and then also the other, the other uh, announcement, we're going to focus on uh, priority resource concerns that we'll address here in Tennessee. So 
All those opportunities will be posted on grants.gov website. And, uh, and we're also working on funding, um, finishing our obligations for our FY21 Conservation Stewardship Program. Renewal application, we did request some additional funds from our national office, and we were able to receive that and, and finish funding our, our Conservation Stewardship Program renewal application. So finally, Commissioner, we are working on direct hire. Uh, we have 17 positions. We have made selections on about nine of those positions, entry-level positions, to try to increase our workforce and also build capacity within USDA. So, Commissioner, that concludes my report. Appreciate the opportunity to give an NRCS update. Thanks, Sheldon. You got a lot of stuff going on. So, uh, Scott, I see you're on there, sir. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll be brief as well. Uh, we continue to work through a lot of issues. Of course, remote working for the most part is, is where we are in extension at this point. Uh, most of our counties remain in what we're calling the alternative phase, essentially through appointments. And uh, that's just as, as a result of what had happened over the holidays and the COVID-19. Probably our biggest challenge, and I think Mr. Crow's on the call, is probably 4-H camps and trying to figure out how we can have them this spring. Uh, there's really a lot of revenue that was lost through the lack of camps last year. And uh, we're, we're trying to, to work through the issues as best as we can and perhaps provide some day camps. Uh, Justin and his team's been working really hard on that. And I think that uh, probably around uh, on or around March 1st, they'll try to figure out what can be done at that point. Um, a lot of virtual meetings that we're going through, uh, of course, a grain conference that we had here uh, not long ago uh, is one example of a lot of those things that have just simply had to be virtual. Uh, a couple of announcements, I guess. Uh, Dr. John, Janet Fox started as uh, department head and assistant dean for family and consumer sciences uh, 1st of February. And so she's replaced uh, Dr. Devereaux, who did a great job for us in the interim. And of course, uh, Mr. Aiken mentioned uh, Dr. Ashley Stokes, and she'll be starting on Monday. So uh, unless you guys need a, an update from a plant sciences department head, I guess this will probably be my last meeting with y'all. But uh, I want to say thank you for the opportunity and uh, really enjoyed getting on with y'all. Thanks, Scott. It's been great working with you, and, and you've done a great job as, as interim dean. So. Much appreciated. Thanks. I believe uh, Jimmy Ogilvy is on. We hadn't had an uh, update from the co-op in a long time, and they've got a big one, I think. Good morning, Dr. Hatcher. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, start off with uh, agronomy. Uh, seed, uh, COVID's largest impact on seed has been logistics over the road and intermodal issues. Uh, we use uh, the intermodal a lot to uh, hauling the seed from the point of production out west back to our warehouses. Uh, second issue of this is the shortage of trucks has caused the prices to increase up to 20%. Crop nutrients, the effects of uh, COVID on the fertilizer industry has been noticeable in the logistical sector as well. Delayed shipments and some hiccups from micronutrient production in foreign countries like Bolivia with zinc have been prevalent. Uh, taking supply earlier has been required. On pro crop protection products, uh, logistics again, uh, delays in receiving and delivering products due to shortage of drivers and warehouse personnel. In the early stages of COVID, uh, these shortages were due to large purchases by locations. In case of shutdowns, uh, supply from the vendors has, has thus been stable since then. Uh, the shortages we're uh, facing now are due to uh, issues outside of COVID. On farm hardware, uh, steel prices has drastically increased in the past few months. Scrap has been at near all-time highs. One U.S. mill reportedly had a major fire, which has limited production. Supply issues of raw steel, along with the higher prices, has caused a 10 to 30 percent increase in wholesale and retail pricing. Lead times has gone out anywhere from six to 20 weeks. We have one vendor whose lead time is out 16 to 18 months. And as Keith uh, alluded to, uh, this will have an impact on TAP reimbursements. Uh, if it's not on the lot, uh, People will either not buy or will just have to file an extension. So we're uh, working with them on that. 
Resin prices as well are beginning to rise. Uh, resin is used in a lot of the uh, Ritchie and, and Miracle waterers, uh, as well as uh, polytwines. So uh, they're they're getting on the game as well. Feed uh, beyond the typical ingredient shortage during the holidays of both products and trucks to deliver. Uh, we experienced a much increased issue from Thanksgiving through the end of January. Uh, a lot of that can be tied back to COVID related issues of manufacturing changes, tied back to restaurant and school lunches for breads and other products. Uh, rise in corn and soybean prices tied back to increased export orders has helped trigger a huge increase in prices. Uh, seen considerable increase prices in soybean meal, cottonseed meal and gluten. These prices are really impacting the dairymen. Uh, it's also gonna make some beef producers rethink their calf crop marketing strategy for the year, as well as herd culling and help for replacement goals. Just a lot of insert uncertainty to the short and long range impact. In animal health, we're experiencing an above normal orders of back orders on key products. Some of this is tied back to production capabilities, reduction, and in some, arenas belief that capacity may have shifted to production of the corona vaccine. That's all from Tennessee Farmers today. Thanks, Jimmy. Is there any other comments or questions for the good of the order? Okay, I don't know if Tina's still on or not. I don't know when our next call is or it may not be scheduled yet, but uh, I'm sure she'll be sending out the presentations or um, some of those today to you. So until next time, y'all be safe out there. Bye-bye.